Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm the author of a book called Revolutionary Mindfulness. That's about meditation and activism. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, a meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. All right, and we're back with another episode of Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt. How are you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. Looking forward to talking about this new Greer uh, video that he just dropped. Was it yesterday, I think? So... Yeah, was yeah. yesterday or the day before day before maybe well we could just start with that yeah Let, Stephen okay. Greer yeah he uh he released a uh a video and I do have a specific clip from it to play um do you uh but I mean we could just summarize because the, the clip I have to play is uh, just a part at the end which touches on a subject it's a, one of the more disturbing subjects in this whole ufology yeah i think the first part of it pretty much was basically saying that congress has made some progress and that they now have the power to subpoena um some individuals and so that's supposed to really help move things forward so we'll see how that goes yeah i I think he was saying that the new speaker of the house is willing to grant the oversight committee subpoena power i don't think they have the subpoena power yet but but uh, the old speaker was not willing to do that. And so, yeah, he was saying this should open doors because some witnesses will not come forward unless they're subpoenaed. I wonder if that was if that's new, though, because I, I was I guess I heard it differently. I thought he said that it had just been granted. So maybe it's not happened yet. I'm not sure. But that was his big news from the first part of the video. I didn't catch the second part very well. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was also saying that um, some of these uh, private contractors are starting to move the extraterrestrial assets underground, right? And uh, to because they know the end is near uh, for them. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. He said, "Move them underground," because is he implying there's some underground places that the government can't get to that might be? He's never said, you know, that there's aliens with deep underground bases. He just says that there's lots of underground military bases. You wonder what that word means, because for me, it can mean just something very secretive, like the Underground Railroad, you know, back in the day. And so, yeah, um, I wonder about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, I could. Why don't I go ahead? Should I go ahead and play the clip from the end of his thing that I want to Please, do? yeah, yeah. Any any highlights? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. The discs and the, the triangular craft and these things that are uh, from Lockheed and Boeing and and uh, Northrop Grumman, et cetera. And um, but he did this as an Air Force officer, fully read in. He has just come out of the skiff, not that meeting, but um, for the uh, Congress. And he has met with members of the Senate. So we have set that up. That just happened. Um, and uh, he is willing to testify under oath publicly, which is uh, a very big deal. He would be by far one of the most important people to come forward, given the operational and specific details he has. Now, there are other people we have who have more information, but they're not willing to, uh, they're currently in the system very high up and they're currently afraid for their their selves and their families uh, if they were to do that uh, so they're providing back channeling through through me frankly that information and and they're willing even however to have a phone call uh, and remotely 
with the key members and investigators to give them the information. Uh, and particularly the criminal activities that uh, we have just discovered in the last few months dealing with the kidnapping of humans and use of, of kidnapped humans from impoverished areas around the world in uh, weird um, what they call P3 uh, experiments uh, uh, dealing with communications with ET craft using uh, human consciousness and technologies and unfortunately drugs. Uh, that program has gotten fully unmasked uh, to us and, and for us in the last few months and that information has been handed off. Uh, but again, it, it involves a whole nexus, let's say a whole complex of places and operations highly compartmented. And so, you know, what our job is, and this is why we need more help who are people listening who may have information on any of these operations, either in the past or currently, is trying to put a million pieces together into a coherent picture uh, with specific information that the U.S., the legal government of the United States, as well as law enforcement, would have to pursue. So that was the uh, clip I wanted to play. Very interesting. You yeah. know, there's just so much that that is coming apart at the seams, you know. Um, all of this disclosure, I, I don't know if you watched the, the uh, Putin interview last night, two hour interview with Putin. A lot of it. Yeah. That's, that's going to unravel a bunch of stuff. I think it's just fa fascinating to see all of this come to light. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I guess we can go ahead since I played that clip from Greer, I just want to like focus on that thread he mentioned. I mean, yeah. did you hear what he said about kidnapping of humans? Yes, yes. The use of kidnapped humans from impoverished areas around the world. And see, this is like one of those parts of this story that is very disturbing that I, I, I believe is, I suspect is one of the deep secrets is that there's a big human trafficking secret here. Yeah. And I have, an, I have another clip I want to play that is uh, another whistleblower. This guy is... Michael Herrera, U.S. Marine, who encountered a uh, a UFO and some some sort of black ops um, military group during a natural disaster in, in the, during the tsunami in Indonesia. And okay, let me. I'm just going to play this part I had queued up. Um, and he's talking about he saw these containers that were being loaded onto a UFO by this black ops military group that had captured him and his Marine group. And he didn't know what was in the containers. And I believe I have this queued up where he talks Ooh. about where he learned. Interesting. But he works in some of these projects at a very, um, some very controversial facilities. He's aware of what was going on. After I gave my presentation of this, he confirmed, he says, no, I, he's like, I don't want to leave Michael hanging out there, but I was not expecting to come and talk to you about this. And he went explaining what the operations do, why they do it, and what they were using them for. And he says, there's not drugs that they're putting in these shipping containers. He says it's humans. Human traffic. Yes. His own words. And, he, you know, of course. And he also wants to come forward, at least uh, with him and 30 other people that are involved with that part of the work. Um, but it was very disheartening to actually get that information relayed to me, because here I'm thinking for years it's drugs and it's a much sinister thing. But it makes sense because they use natural disasters that people are going to be missing anyway. Yeah. It, that's, Scoop up people. I mean, I just, uh, I've been covering human trafficking this year. Right. And... It's, you know, a lot of the human trafficking comes from third world countries in distress. You're in a third world area yep. in distress right after a hearth, right after an earthquake would be, I mean, it's prime, yeah. prime time to, to do a human trafficking operation. Right. How big were the containers? Uh, I would say probably eight feet and 10 feet, eight feet tall, 10 feet with him. So like maybe half a Connex box? Yeah, about that. Okay. And they were kind of like on a, the trailer that was underneath was kind of like a regular Humbry trailer that you would see kind of pull stuff, something like that. How were they being lifted into the craft? So they were driving onto this platform that was angled, so it hit, and it just raised up, and they were just driving on this ramp. Oh, the but truck the whole would go thing, up? Yeah, but the whole thing was a ramp, okay, like a circular ramp. And, I mean, obviously I can't see what's on the— 
excuse me, the other side of it, but I'm assuming because it's a circular pattern that it's gonna be the same on the other side. Because they would drive on this platform and at that point I saw all the doors open, four guys would come out and then I'd go back to what we're facing here with these guys searching our stuff, asking us questions, taking our IDs, trying to intimidate the crap out of us. And um, so I can see the guys come out of the truck and that was making me think too, like at a tactical advantage, we didn't have that. There's only six of us, basically trained infantry Marines. And there's these guys here that are, you know, doing this operation and very skilled, very methodical, very calculated, very precise. And if there's eight of them, and now all of a sudden every single truck has four of these guys, I know that it's not just these guys that are running a perimeter. Yeah, so this whole thing he's describing, these containers are being loaded up onto a flying saucer, a giant flying saucer, which uh, they have a... Wow. We'll probably find um Michael. do you think this is what all the the majority of this child and and human trafficking thing is is um i mean what is going why where where are all these people going i'm i'm thinking about you know the southern border too i mean all of these people who are just in yeah. the middle of of these tragedies um well i got another clip on the same topic okay <laughs> this is oh, more dear. so now this is so this is a much older clip and and we played a part of uh this talk this is alex collier and he's been talking for years and he claims he's been talking to andromedan aliens for years and they explained to him what the alien interest in humans or human trafficking is and this is a part of a t old talk he gave and Someone asks him about the story of reptilians feeding off of humans. And this is what he oh, says. Oh. You know, through the conditioning, the programming, the crime, all of that. I've heard that the reptilians feed off our fear. Is that true? Um, the graves do and the orions do. The reptilians tend to live off the flesh. Oh, <laughs> That's not an area I like to go into much. Um, but according to the Andromedans, the last 25 years, the reptilians that are on the planet are responsible for over 30,000 children disappearing. I get in a lot of trouble when I talk in UFO circles about this. You can't talk about that, Alice. Why not? Yeah, we in Westchester problems. County, New York, in the last three years, 5,000 children yeah. have disappeared without a trace. In New York? Westchester County, New York. Yeah. Wow. George Andrews. Uh, E.T. Friends and Foes, he's got a huge uh, section in this book on that. And nobody so I just want to pause it for a sec. He, he's mentioning a specific book. I don't know that book, but George Andrews, E.T. Friends and Foes, says he has a, uh, there's a huge section in that book about child and human trafficking by aliens, I guess. And, that uh, is absolutely, I mean, 5,000 in Westchester County alone. That I went to college there. That's where I went to college. That's shocking. I mean, yeah. 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 There, I was going to play a little bit. Let me play a little bit more of this before we. Okay. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk about it. You know, denial is the dragon we all have to slay right now. It isn't Lucifer, it isn't Satan. It's denial, denial of our own divinity and responsibility. Yes, sir. Is it all the missing people or children who disappear? Is it just uh, draconians or are there other races taking children just for other purposes to take them back? Graves have done extensive, extensively taken children as well. Uh, a lot of them are on their motherships. A lot of the children were taken to Phobos, which is also an artificial satellite. And um, They've been experimented on. Um, the planet as a whole, over 100,000 people a year vanish without a trace on the planet. They figure 25,000 in the United States on an average just disappear without a trace. That was, I just wanted to play that part. So, and I guess we, I might as well just do a quick check um, of that fact he's saying. Okay. How many people a year disappear? Did he say, what did he say, 20,000? No, he says 100,000 a year oh. uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. How many people a year disappear without a job? According to the National Missing and Identified Persons database, 
More than 600,000 people go missing annually. Wow. Even if, even if it was just half that, let's say half of it is, you know, sold off into slavery or something, but half of that is, is just mind blowing. That would be 300,000 people just going off to into space or something. Wow. Well, it's, so yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, if you, if you just sort of like stop and think about this, you know, if, if there are aliens some sort non-humans here that are a completely separate civilization a completely separate culture and they've been here for thousands of years they have to have a reason there has to be a purpose or a resource here that they are here for they have to be doing something they can't just be like on vacation flying around in and out of the <laughs> oceans just for fun right they're, they're doing something so they're Either there's minerals or plants or something here, or they live here. They just simply live here. My guess is that they're just doing probably thousands of experiments. I mean, this is just one big Petri dish of, of interesting stuff. And humans are, are probably just one thing that they're interested in, but they might be interested in a million things about us. Yeah. Um if they've been here for thousands or even millions of years, I'm sure they're they're doing all kinds of stuff. But this is, I mean, this is three, I mean, uh, I mean, this is more data points. Stephen Greer just confirmed, and and he and it's interesting that Greer is saying this is new information to him. Like he did not realize before a few months ago that kidnapping humans was such a huge part of what was happening. Wow. So that's that's interesting that Greer in that what you heard him say, you know, he said Yeah, yeah, this, but it's yeah, bigger. Mm -hmm. That this criminal activity is uh, new to him, which I don't he's been he's been getting information for a long time. I can't believe he just found this out. So, but maybe that's anyways, besides accusing him of uh, not telling the truth, let's just assume that's he's confirming finally that human trafficking is a part of this story. Wow. That guy, okay. that that Marine Michael Herrera also confirmed that these UFOs are somehow a part of human trafficking. And I can't believe that those black ops humans that were loading people from the tsunami in Indonesia onto that UFO, I can't believe they were doing that for simple human slavery operations of other humans on Earth. Right. It has to be for the aliens. And so, I mean, there's only a few different you know, it's not that hard to imagine what you would use humans for. And I, and I don't, you know, but one of the, I, I was mentioning this to a friend of mine and she said, why would you kidnap humans? I mean, it's like, why would you like steal cows from fields? Just raise them yourself. Is it that hard to just like have a population and breed them yourself? And if you, if you're eating them or turning them into slaves of some sort, why would you need to steal humans from that that had been raised free unless they get some sort of thrill off of kidnapping a human and you know having us be terrified um i i think they're i mean the thing that comes to my mind is is genetics genetic manipulation and uh, i may i don't know maybe they're trying to you know create still working on it right trying to create the perfect human i don't know that's frustrating not knowing, but it's huge. I guess it like it lends, you know, it supports there this idea that um, that one of the darker, darker ideas is that they they like uh, what is it adrenochrome or something? It's uh, oh, right. that yeah. they they want this um, some chemical or hormones that get into the blood and they extract it and it's used for almost like a fountain of youth treatment for some people and and literally, that it's you uh you want a human being or a child to be terrified because it releases the hormones and that's how they get the that's oh, how they man. harvest it that's but, that that's yeah that's yeah. really beyond what i want to envision Good yeah job. i well yeah it's so it's such a anyways so that's one dark crazy thread <laughs> and um but it's just like it's hard to believe i mean because i do believe there are there are benevolent aliens. 
I do absolutely believe there can't, you know, it, it seems like there's a ton of different aliens. And actually, I've got another clip to play that I think it's it's always worth uh, sharing. Um, Danny Sheehan talking about the different uh, aliens that exist. And why don't I just play this clip and then we can just talk about. Um, OK, so this is Danny Sheehan. This is Danny Sheehan, the lawyer for Lou Elizondo, who also yeah. worked with Stephen Greer. And this is him just answering the question. I got two clips from him I really want to talk about, and it's a little more uplifting. Um, but this is first him answering the question about what type of aliens exist. Visiting yes. or interacting with us here on Earth, I think maybe four to seven. I don't know if that's yes, yeah. accurate. I don't know if that's yeah. what you've said. Like yes. the greys, reptilians. Could you kind of list what, what these other species, as to the best of your knowledge, what, yeah. what, is, the, the, what is actually visiting us here? What's interacting with us? The, 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 the one species that is the most well-known, of course, is the, what they call the small greys. Uh, these right. are like three and a half uh, feet tall, small uh, with large heads, uh, you know, uh, oval shaped eyes, the classic you know, three, alien, three fingers, the classic little alien. But, but there's also a tall gray, uh, species that is mm -hmm. virtually the same, uh, people, but they're, they're like five to six feet tall. You know, they'll yeah. look you right straight in the eye. Uh, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't have to scooch to have any contact with them. They're right up in your face. Uh, and then there is the reptilians. And it's important that the, the reptilians uh, get this really bad rap, uh, you know, that people say, oh, it was like a reptile, you know, it's like a lizard or snake, you know, uh, but, but they're, they're more like the, uh, the little uh, insurance uh, geeko, gecko guy, you know, but, but they're big, they're tall, they're like six feet tall, uh, mm -hmm. and, but, they're, but they're, they're actually quite benign. A very friendly, uh, kind of affectionate, uh, you know, that uh, Barbara Lamb, for example, who's one of the preeminent uh, psychiatrists in the field that has uh, conducted uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of interviews with people who've had encounters with different beings. You know, she, she was uh, wanting after many, many years and decades indeed of, of, of interviewing people about this and trying to assist them with the, the kind of trauma that these encounters kind of generate sometimes that she actually wanted so much to really get to see one of these so, so that she could actually know positively that they're real. And yeah. uh, one, she told the story, one afternoon, she comes back from her garden, she comes into her house, and there is one of the, the reptile uh, species standing in her living room, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, the, it, it, he was very uh, uh, mellow, very friendly, uh, kept co communicating to her telepathically, okay, everything's fine, don't worry. You're, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we were real and that we're kind. Uh, and uh, she, was, she was just uh, extraordinarily uh, happy to get to have that happen. Uh, so there's the reptiles. Uh, and, they, and the problem is they've been given a really bad rap by the Church of Scientology, for example. Uh, people don't don't realize this about the Church of Scientology, but that the one of the major premises of the Church of Scientology is that there is such an extraterrestrial civilization, and that there's this fundamental dialectical conflict going on uh, between the reptilians that come from uh, Beta Reticuli uh, and the uh, Pleiadians uh, that come from the Pleiades, uh, and they assert that this is a very very human. Uh, uh, species uh, in the Pleiades, and they actually assert that these are ancestors of ours, right. uh, and right. that they've seeded this. So that there's that third, there's a, a, in addition to both the short and the tall grays mm -hmm. and the reptilians, there's this other assertion that there are these very human looking like uh, species that are in fact our ancestors. This is the Billy Meyer uh, uh, trope. Uh, about this species. Uh, and then there's uh, an additional one, a fifth one, which, which they call the mantis people. Uh, these are extremely tall, seven feet tall, extremely thin, uh, uh, almost a mantis, like praying mantises, mm -hmm. a very tall, kind of little scooched over. Uh, really, very interestingly, whenever the, uh, there's a sighting of any of the mantis people, if they're in the company of any of these other species, uh, every all the other species seem to sort of uh, uh, acknowledge that the mantis people are the ones in charge. Oh, just pause it there. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Wow.
Yeah, so I love I mean, Church of Scientology. That that was a surprise. I, I didn't realize that about them. Yeah, I mean, I had heard some some you know versions of what they believe in Scientology, but I hadn't heard it put that way in that sort of succinct um, way. So yeah, I always like a nice summary of the different aliens that, uh, and and that goes along with uh, with Richard Dolan's summary and. My other research these seem to be the, the five different aliens that exist and there's definitely one that looks like humans one of the things that that sort of is this confusing point for me is that you know greer talks especially in this talk we listened to earlier is about you know there are these um secret covert organizations moving underground he said what they're moving primarily is you know their their own technology that they have back engineered they're you know the triangular saucers and uh, even bodies and it makes me wonder maybe they are actually manufacturing i've heard this before that these uh these alien androids in these these small grays right mm -hmm. some people say these are androids i wonder if a lot of this is is human made and that they are taking children to produce this drug that you mentioned. Now that's a far off theory, but it, it kind of puts some puzzle pieces together. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely heard that. Um, and, and it's, I've heard that in descriptions of the small grays that they seem almost robots, like robots, yeah. like they might mm -hmm. just be some sort of biological Android. Um, I've heard that a number of times, so it makes me wonder <laughs> who's making them, right? Who's right? Who's and plugged and into? I would think I would think that they, I mean, it's it could be any of the other alien species. I mean, it could be the human aliens, but it there it makes a little logical sense to me if one of the species doesn't really comfortably live on in an oxygen atmosphere. And that's, that's something Collier said. He said that a lot of the reptilians underground are there because they need a different atmosphere and they live in a methane environment. And so they would need to build either use some other beings to come up to earth and do stuff and to grab abduct humans or whatever. So they might've manufactured the grays as a, a type of servant robot and whoever built the grays if they have a need for robots like that then they would have plenty of use for human slaves also because if you if you know because it, it's i mean it, a human being is the greatest servant you could have for you know doing any sort of task it's why we're trying to build tesla bots and androids and as soon as we have a Tesla bot Air Android, it's going to re start replacing human labor like crazy because it's sure. just, yeah. so it's it. And, you know, throughout history, I mean, if the, if the aliens, if some of the aliens helped found human civilization, helped us build these giant pyramids and helped us organize then, and they were coaching us or educating us, then clearly they didn't have a problem with slavery because human civilization was founded on slavery immediately it was created as a method of progress and of getting things done and getting a source of labor. So it seems to indicate that if there's, if there's some alien cultures that have been here for thousands of years, they had no principal objection to the concept of slavery because they allowed us to do it. Um, and uh, never, you know, it was almost seems like it's actually one of the more inspiring things. If, as I look at history, that it looks like the, idea of slavery being wrong and all beings having value and equal rights is a really revolutionary idea that humans came up with yeah <laughs> that, oh yeah isn't that interesting that yeah. it's always kind of been around yeah and it's like it's and the idea of freedom and equality actually might be an idea that threatens the culture of these uh alien cultures it might <laughs> threaten yeah. their the way they function because they may enslave a, you know they might have a, ser a serious caste system that enslaves uh, some part of their species as well as possibly our species you know i just have this sense that that you know they're, they're going to continue to um take advantage or use us or you know like we you know raise farm animals you know for their products and, and that we might just continue to do be a a, a sort of a resource for them 
until we, you know, really claim our sovereignty. And, and I'm thinking that part of humanity is maybe waking up to this and saying, wait a minute, you know, we, we don't, we don't want to be slaves, get off our planet or whatever. Um, and this, this disclosure, how far do you think it's going to go? Because yeah, I think the farther I mean, it goes, the more people are going to just wake up and say, you know, we declare our own independence, <laughs> go away. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's unraveling. It seems like, um, and I, and so I have, um, and you know how there was that, uh, the UAP Disclosure Act that they attempted to pass as part of the uh, NDAA. You remember mm -hmm. that uh, the large bill? Well, I have another clip here from Sheehan talking about that. And it's, you know, a lot of people said that the Disclosure Act failed to pass because it was blocked by Mike Turner um, of Ohio. But it, actually, it didn't all get blocked. A big portion of it did pass. And it's, uh, he says in this clip, he describes how enough of it passed that they are, um, that the clock started and for, there's like 300 days for private contractors to reveal to Congress uh, to give them an index of all extraterrestrial materials they have. And I just want to play the clip and then we can talk about it. Yeah. Senators, all Democratic senators, all 17 of them completely agreed with this 64 page bill. Uh, and uh, it passed the United States Senate and then it was sent over to the House uh, and it ran into the uh, head of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, a fellow, fellow by Michael Turner. And it turns out he is the congressman from the district in Ohio uh, yeah. that is the site of the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to yeah. which the Roswell craft have been taken. Uh, and the bodies from the Roswell crash back in July of 1947. And they were dug in deeply to try to protect uh, this information because it turns out they were working with a, a major a private aerospace corporation, uh, Radiant Technology. Uh, the, their major field office was based right there next to the air base <laughs> in Ohio. And yeah. so this guy ended up sticking his thumb in the eye of everybody else and blocking uh, the ability to extract the information from the private aerospace industry uh, pursuant to the right of eminent domain of the United States government to take custody of these craft or to get it put back into the hands of the government. But we, we succeeded in getting 24 pages of the 64 pages uh, passed, uh, which, which, is this, which is this act here. And this is the act that is presently a law in the United States, and it mandates uh, every single one of the six uh, United States defense uh, military agencies uh, or the military services, all uh, 18 United States intelligence agencies, uh, all 32 United States Defense Department agencies, and all the private aerospace corporations that have any information about the UFO uh, issue and the, the non-human intelligence Mm -hmm. that is understood to be responsible for this UFO phenomenon to be handed over to the National Archives within 300 days. So the date is, just so people will know it, uh, is October 17th of this year. Uh, so the, the, the uh, head of the archives uh, for the National Archives has now been ordered to prepare a, an entire a process of taking these documents into the possession of the archives. That uh, has to be initiated by February 23rd, uh, basically a, a month from now. Yeah. Uh, and the all the agencies uh, designated have to start gathering together all of this information and putting it into a, a digital format with an index and a searchable index and get ready to turn it over uh, to, to the uh, uh, to the archives, which has to be completed uh, by October 17th of, of this year. So we are in the process of disclosure, yeah. finally, after after all these years, you know, I've been at this for over 45 years. Yeah, so that was uh, when I heard him say this, I was like, okay, that sounds way more positive and optimistic than um, my understanding was, you know, I was under, I was under the impression it was there wasn't much teeth that got passed, but that, you know, he's saying 
they passed that in, incredibly important part that said you have 300 days to give us all your info. They they don't have the teeth to really enforce it, but it is a, a law. It is required. And so uh October 17th. So yeah. Now is he going to be making these these archives public, do you think? Well, uh, it's it's the National Archives. It's right. it's, it's a government so archives yeah. thing. It's you know, you just said that there is, you know, the there is the the president still has the discretion to, you know, uh, keep anything secret, just like he has with the JFK assassination files. Mm. But it it you know it creates a structure to make things like the Tic Tac videos and the jellyfish video and and you know it it it's basically setting the stage for what they were trying to accomplish was they were trying to say look the government needs to get all the information together and figure out what the true history is the true the truth about what has been going on and start figuring out a way to tell the people tell humanity um i mean the story is coming out in these pieces and it seems that there are there might be some dark dark aspects of it and, and who knows it might be so dark that you know it does uh cause all of humanity to wake up and say, okay, we're basically in a Petri dish controlled by aliens and we've <laughs> exactly. got to just. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would think that could be what we see. I mean, if suddenly all the, the big drape is just pulled off, I think that's, that's what we might see. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Pretty amazing. Yeah, but, but it's good to know that, you know, that, uh, you know, I, I was glad to hear that he's like, we we did pass something significant and it's putting pressure to keep this disclosure movement going. And yeah, and they, they need to keep that in the limelight, too, because I, I can just imagine that it would fade away and everybody would forget about that deadline. But uh, yeah, we should uh, keep it in the light. Yeah. So October 17th. Interesting. And what was it he said was happening this month, February 20th? third or something uh, oh that was the date that the national archives needs to be ready to start ready. receiving information yeah um yeah okay wow so, yeah wow you always bring good stuff to the table here i i learn a lot <laughs> <laughs> well news. i've got i've got another one it's it's kind of a different topic um, okay all right well this, this is a little different. This is again back to Alex Collier, who I find kind of fascinating. Again, the guy who said he's been talked to talking to Andromedan aliens his whole life. And uh this I found and i basically he describes that he had a uh an out of body experience where he encountered an angel and then he told the Andromedan aliens about this encounter and he discusses what they said about it. And I, th I think it's worth just listening to. <laughs> so oh, great. I'm playing this at a little bit higher speed just because he talks a little slow. And I think it'll be okay. In 2003, February of 2003, on my father's birthday, I had an experience with what I call an angel. Now, those people who are close to me know about this. My immediate family know about this. I have this is the first time I'm telling the story publicly. And I had just lost my family and I was uh, in a horrible place, absolutely horrible place. I wanted to leave. I didn't give a damn about aliens. I didn't give a damn about the A's. I didn't care about anything. I wanted to leave. And one particular night, which I think was the worst night, I was uh, in bed and I was ready to leave. And at some point I fell asleep. The next thing I know is that there's someone standing at the foot of my bed and it was a woman. And I didn't see the wings at first. I just saw the woman. And the next thing that I know is that I am in her arms above the ceiling of, of my bedroom. And I'm looking down at my body in bed and she is holding me. And all she said to me was, how do you feel? And I just said, I feel safe. And she said, look down at, at, at you. And I looked down at myself in the bed. And all I did was start to cry. Because I could see all the hurt, I could see all the pain. And then she reminded me that, that that is not who you are. This is who you are. The part of 
be that she was holding. I, I didn't, at, at that moment, I didn't feel any of that. And she reminded me that I'm the soul, okay? That I'm the soul and that's the body. And that it's important to remember the difference between the soul and the body. The soul animates the body. It is not the other way around. And it's easy to get lost in that. I also remember saying to her, I didn't think you, you existed. And she already knew what I said, what I had said previous. And she said, well, they don't see us. And I asked her why. She goes, because we will it. We will that they don't see us. And later I was able to find out that most of the ETs, regardless of their dimensional level, don't see this group. And I shared this experience when it was over with Mornay. They, went, they took a new picture of me. So I just want to clarify, Mornay is the Andromedan alien that he's been talking to for years. And what he just said is, they took a new picture of me, which I think they have some ability to, uh, to take a picture of any experience of his life. I don't know if they're recording it or something. I'm sure he's explained this before, but I just wanted to clarify what that little. That's interesting. Okay. But here, I'll play the rest of what he. Yep. I shared this experience when it was over with Mornay. They, went, they took a new picture of me. They went back and they took this event out. And it has taken all this time, all this time to finally have him get back to me, which he did. And in, in their opinion and the opinion of other groups in upper dimensions, this, this angel, all angels, exist in a realm that is above all physicality in this universe and that they are in fact real. My event, my moment has been shared with many different races and multiple dimensions. I had no intention of that. That wasn't what it was about, but I had been told that angels weren't real and now they are and now they are. And now I understand why I bring this to your attention. Because ladies and gentlemen, you have angels. We all have angels. We all have angels on our side. We have angels on our side here, helping us with what's going down on earth. Because many people are having those experiences. And in the very beginning when I talked about this, I shared the information I was given. That information turned out not to be accurate. And I'm sharing that information. I am correcting that information now. Angels are real. Whatever they are, whoever they are, they do in fact exist. And apparently they do step in when they're most needed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I just found that story so fascinating, especially the because he's a unique, you know, if he's telling the truth about speaking to aliens, it was just fascinating that the angel said that the aliens, the ETs don't see them because the angels don't let them. And then when well, he... I think also uh, the way I interpreted that is like angels are functioning on a higher frequency, mm -hmm. you know, like up uh, probably up in the in the fifth and sixth and seventh chakra or whatever. And and uh, as far as I understand, in those frequencies, the lower frequencies do not have access to that. Mm -hmm. And I and I imagine that's that's kind of why they can't see because they're not tuned into it. Yeah, well, it's it's the the reaction from his Andromedan alien friend that they took a picture of it and then they studied it and shared it with other aliens and they all studied it and came back and said that, I mean, they basically confirmed from their study of it that the angel was real. They they could have come back and told him, ah, you just had a dream, but um, that's, that's not what they said. And it's just weird that they, it seems like the aliens didn't know that the angels were real. Like they had to study his experience for them to be like, huh, there's something here we don't know about. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That, oh, wow. That taps into some other philosophies I've heard. And that is that the uh, fifth, oh, let's see, fifth level, right? The fifth dimension, we could say, needs the third dimension in order to reach the sixth or seventh dimension. In other words, they can't get higher they can't evolve above where they are without us they need something about this three-dimensional plane that they require in order for their own progression to happen that's another theory i've heard 
Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. It's just sort of, uh, that's fascinating to me because, you know, I listen to these near death experiences where people talk about leaving their body and talking to angels and going to something somewhere like heaven where you're at perfect peace and then they come back into their bodies. And it's, you know, if it's and his experience that night where he was lifted up by an angel out of his body seems very much similar to that. And yet it seems to be ha happening in a dimension completely different than this than this level where you're talking to aliens, like the aliens, these ETs are on this, in this world with us, like in like 3d world They're they're grays, reptilians, mantids, they're here, but this other world with angels and heaven, which, and from, I'm not saying this is like a divine thing. I'm just saying, it just seems like to me, it just fits with simulation theory that we are in some sort of almost video game and our, our souls, our identities go up into this heaven realm which is just a an upper layer of this video game is, is we got to get to the next level yeah. <laughs> that's why yeah. i hear my grandson say oh i gotta get to the next level that's yeah. what it is it's a, it's, an, yeah. it's a game yeah but it makes it makes me now i need to do a deep dive into near-death experiences and see if anyone goes to heaven do they see aliens there do they see other species of beings Ooh. or is it only humans is there is it like is there a human only heaven dimension with human centric angels or do any of these et species share the same you know heaven or do they have their own is there an et heaven that's a literally a different <laughs> totally different dimension I mean, hey, i'd love to know well, i would too i would too that would be pretty pretty wild maybe pretty soon we're going to know everything who knows yeah well, until uh, then, we uh, are just going to have to rest in this not knowing, which causes anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. we, are we with okay that, with a, a brief meditation before please. we? Let's okay. do it. Okay, yeah, now that we're all scared <laughs> to death and not sure about what's real and what's <laughs> happening. Yeah, we can feel that uncertainty, that uh that anxiety that kind of floats around, like, what's going to happen? Are we being used and abused? But let's remember that we are not these bodies. And that I think a lot of this is about overcoming those lower chakras that are holding us in fear. Um, and to acknowledge it, it's, just, it's not that fear has to be eliminated, it's part of the body. And so we can acknowledge it without abiding in that place of fear. So for just a few moments, let's take a few breaths and sit together, listen to the bell, just to calm our mind. Take a couple of nice deep breaths and we'll just remember that whatever got us here will also deliver us. So we don't have to really worry about anything. The trees grow, the planets come and go, everything is happening and we don't have really any control over anything. So let's just abide in that space and get comfortable with it. All we know for now is that we have bodies that we are abiding in and these bodies are breathing in and breathing out. We have these senses that we can relate to the world through. We see colors shapes, forms. We smell things, we touch things, we hear things. This is our only true experience. Everything else is in the don't know. We don't know.
but we know we're right here listening breathing together Let's see if we can bring that energy up a little bit into the heart, just to appreciate the phenomenal world that we live in, and the phenomenal universe for that matter. It's all a mystery, and we're all right here watching it unfold. Breathing in and breathing out. Each time the mind wanders off on a train of thought, noticing that is a superpower because that gives us choice. We can always return to the breath. with the last word of metta let's just send out a wish may all beings be well may all beings be uplifted to higher understanding and wisdom and may we all be free Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. Yeah, until next time. Yeah. Bye-bye.